Good morning. Today on Spotlight, our roundtable discussion on Michigan and Detroit politics and the latest on national and international politics with dangerous hotspots and controversial presidential tweets making news every single day. Journalists Ingrid Jocks and Bankale Thompson of the Detroit News will join me. And later, my conversation with Channel 7 videographer Matthew Dale about his recent trip to Cuba. It's Sunday, July the 9th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Welcome to Spotlight. Good to have you back. How's summer going? It's great. Great? Fast. Yeah. fast. All right, fast, Michigan fast. Michigan summers are too fleeting. Yeah. <laughs> but it's been pretty here. Yeah. Um, all right, speaking of pretty, the Michigan legislature, <laughs> they're out uh, getting a little rest here. Uh, first six months, uh, highlights, uh, has it been a good six months or? I think it's, I think it's been kind of, uh, it's really highlighted the growing tensions between what the governor wants to get done and what uh, lawmakers do. We've got a new crop of uh, Republican lawmakers, especially in the House, mm -hmm. they're young. Uh, they're, there's a lot of complicated issues they're having to learn pretty quickly. But while things got off to a rocky start, they were able to accomplish um, teacher pension reform, which I think was, was a really huge accomplishment. It was something the states needed for a long time and several previous attempts have failed. So lawmakers were able to put together enough of a compromise to get Snyder's support. And Snyder didn't get everything he wanted in there, but he got some of it and they were enough. eventually able to yeah. come to some yeah. sort of happy medium in there because the legislature at first was saying, look, it's our way or no way. Uh, and they weren't even talking, but then they- Right, they wanted to close off the, the MIPSERS uh, school employee pension system altogether to new employees. And Snyder was afraid if you do that, you don't have new employees contributing into the system, which creates these transition costs. But lawmakers uh, kept a, a caveat open so that teachers could choose a hybrid pension mm -hmm. so that there will be some new money likely coming into the system. So that, that went over Snyder. All right, Bankley, what kind of grades you give uh, well, the governor uh, and the legislature the first six months? I, I want to switch the pendulum quickly in that same uh, uh, line. That I would have loved to see an infrastructure bill for the city of Flint. I think Flint has been in the backbone. I think we no longer talk about Flint water crisis per se, aside from, you know, the charges that emanate from the Attorney General's office. Yeah, the Attorney General Shooty, he's talking about Flint. Mm -hmm. He is talking about, from a law enforcement perspective, and right. all of those things remains to be seen in terms of, you know, whether in fact these charges will stand the test of, you know, the Constitution in court. But I would have loved to see the legislature take on a big infrastructure bill for the city of Flint because Flint is still struggling. And I feel like, uh, you know, everybody has walked away from the city of Flint. Mm -hmm. But they did do money for infrastructure statewide right um and got a budget together now it did no. take it did take longer you know, yes. almost a month longer to get that done and snyder still is fighting for this good jobs package that mm -hmm. that really has a lot, a lot of bipartisan support but especially house leadership was hesitant to sign on to it uh, a few weeks ago but uh in our paper this week the governor is still advocating for that and uh, that's one that could have a real impact on the state lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly, uh, we were all up at Mackinac. He rolled out this big package of <laughs> part-time legislature. Did he get the bump that you think he was expecting to get? Well, I mean, I think that whole that whole announcement was kind of strange on several levels, and it's it's backfired on on Kelly, I think. I and mean, he he did this big countdown clock for at least a month, I think, ahead of time. And it, it looked like he was paving the way for a, a run for governor. Yeah, everybody thought that's what. Yeah, the I mean, it was, was all about selling be. himself, selling what he'd done for the state, and um, and then it, he, in turn, just launches this part-time legislature proposal, which uh, got a lot of resistance right away. And I mean, it looks like it wasn't as well put together, as well thought out as it should have been. Um, our paper's been very critical of of just moving to a part-time legislature without including term limits reform, uh, loosening those up. Yeah, but what do you think, Becca? I mean, I mean, it's sort of like um, term limitation right. to the average person out there. Right. They aren't crazy about elected officials in the first place. Right. And sometimes these type of ideas are attractive to them because they're sort of like throw all the bums out anyway. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's public optics, but when you look at the substance though, uh, you know, it cuts both ways. You know, there's a good argument, argument to make for part-time legislature, but given all the problems that Michigan is facing right now, 
do we really need a part-time legislature or do we need legislators to go to work full-time? The question is, how do we hold them accountable to make sure that they deliver? He would have been better off choosing education, choosing the Flint infrastructure issue, and there are other issues that he could have chosen to really yeah. relaunch or in a very subtle and way launch his campaign. Right, yeah, and I think you're right. But also, I mean, just in this last week, he's, Callie's come out and, and basically said, do over, he's going to change the language in, on his petition drive, which means the thousands of signatures they've already supposedly collected are thrown out. So he's, he's not making any friends, even among his initial supporters. I mean, some of these folks who've put a lot of time into gathering these, these uh, initial signatures aren't happy that they feel like their so time's been wasted. Quick, quick so question before walking like Michael <laughs> Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in Motown, that's a great musical analogy. Um, <laughs> Quick question before we go to the break. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, I mean, Attorney General Bill Schuette, uh, it's widely thought for, among all of us, I think, for a long time that he's gearing up for a run for a governor. Um, does his run hinge on what happens with Flint? Well, he's not whether or not he gets in, but the success of it, that if he's not successful with these charges, then that's something he's going to have to deal with, with all the taxpayer money. By the same token, if he's able to get Maybe, these convictions, sure. then he looks like, well, hey, I he, protected consumers when nobody else was. Yeah. And even if he doesn't, he, he can say hey, he was tough on bringing people to justice, you know, even top members of the Snyder administration. Uh, he's thrown out the specter that there still may be um, charges coming higher up. So uh, I think either way, think he's, he gets he's to the playing. governor too early to tell? I don't know, but he, he's, ke he's kept it on the table that that is possible. Well, let me put it out there. I, I don't see how, and, and Shudi may disagree here, but you know, this is the political mind in me speaking. There is no way a Republican Attorney General will charge, bring charges against an incumbent Republican governor, and that, that Attorney General expects to be nominated by the Republican Party. But he's trying to create. Governor. But he is trying to create you know. as much distance as he can from, yeah, from well, Snyder, who has he, run into right. <laughs> many, many issues. Right. So and, and rightfully, you know, rightfully so, he's trying to do that. But again, I think people are seeing this as an optics. Should is doing this because he's trying to run for governor. He's going to be, you know, a very strong candidate. And you know, to his credit, honestly, Chuck, you know, for the people in Flint, uh, whether these charges are successful or not, it's a question of. At least somebody stepped up, somebody brought charges. All right, we got to get to a break. Uh, we come back, we'll talk a little bit about Detroit Public Schools and what they need to be doing over the summertime. And we can't let this show get by without turning our attention <laughs> to national and international right. politics. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Spotlight. Okay, uh, Detroit Public Schools Community District has new leadership. Mm -hmm. Got the summertime, try to get everything together for the fall. Uh, quick to-do list. <laughs> it's long. <laughs> yeah, and I think true. Nikolai Vidi, the new superintendent, is very well aware of the challenges facing him. And he knows that it's going to take time for him just coming into the district to sort of put this strategic plan that he wants together. But I think the initial steps he's taken are thoughtful. And um, and that includes hiring a, a strong team at the top of deputy superintendents. He's including getting a lot more people, a lot more people who were in administration back into the exactly, classroom. Exactly, that's huge. But Alicia Merriweather, who was in interim, is staying on, and I think that's huge. She had a really good rapport with the district and had some several excellent projects underway. And she and has the support of teachers. teachers. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think when the, the, this move that Dr. Vitti has made to get, I think there are 140 uh, master teachers, specialists, who were just focusing on, on helping other teachers, but they weren't in the classroom. And as Vidi said, that just doesn't make sense when you're facing almost 200 uh, teacher vacancies right now. So he's, he's going to move those teachers into teaching roles, which it makes a lot of sense. And he, he's, he was able to do that while um, you know, not, not upsetting the teachers union, it right. looks like. So. Frankly, your take on that and uh, 
even though it hasn't gotten as much attention as I think a lot of people thought, we're coming up on uh, August primary and some of those races uh, seem to be yawners. <laughs> uh -huh. well, uh, well, you know, I'm waiting with bated breath about Nikolai Vidi's magic and how it's going to work. I think we wish him well and hopefully he succeeds. Uh, we've been here many times before. I mean, the, the, the superintendent position has been like a musical chair at the district. So I think, you know, we wish him well and it, you know, we'll see the first six months what right. that looks like. But coming to the uh, races, I think the city clerk race is an interesting race to that watch. That is an interesting race. You know, uh, seven, I think seven candidates. Right. right. We yeah. have six of them uh, at right. Booker T. Washington Business Association. Yeah. Right. Um, but. Uh, I mean, you know, political convention says the more candidates, the incumbent does better, mm -hmm. you know, and I think they will divide the, the, the votes among themselves. Uh, when we get into the general, then it will be interesting to see. Uh, reference to the city council race, I think the race that we also need to watch is the one between Mary Sheffield and Jewel Ware. Uh, in that race, Mary Sheffield only has Jewel Ware running against us, so they're actually going For to Detroit the, City Council. Yeah, yeah. They're going to the general election, which is an important district because it's downtown, it's Boston Edison, so you have a bevy of the business community and the middle class black neighborhoods in that district in itself. So that's a, that's a race to watch. Okay. Uh, the mayor's race, uh, has it created the steam that you <laughs> thought it would going into the primary? Or no? I don't, I don't see uh, Mayor Duggan having too tough of a time getting reelected, but I mean, I think this whole uh, election season is going to be a referendum on you know, Mayor Duggan, the city council, which has been leading the city post bankruptcy. And um, I think a lot of positive strides have been made. I think Duggan's been a strong leader and he's still got much to do on his to-do list. But as he says, if say, Coleman Jr. has a has a better has a better plan. Put it forward, Put it forward. and I don't ha think he really has. Ha has Coleman Young Jr. presented a better plan? I have not seen a plan. I've written about this issue a number of times. I've not seen a plan. I've actually a plan, but maybe we'll see a plan before we get to the August primary here. Uh, but I think uh, the mayor understands that he may have a race uh, here if, uh, because, you know, his speech at Mark, you know, the, you know, looking at Detroit's history and all of that, I think was somewhat of a preemptive strike, if you will, for those who may ask questions about, you know, the city's uh, racial struggles in the past and how it economically impacts present day reality. Uh, but it remains to be seen what's gonna happen. We have to wait and see if Coleman obviously may make it to the prime beyond the primary then you know i think that's when the real race begins right after the primary ingrid jacks frank L. A. thompson both of the detroit news thank you for joining us today on spotlight and coming up we'll sit down with uh videographer matt dell here at channel seven about his recent trip to cuba we'll be right back And welcome back to Spotlight. Joining me now is Matthew Dale. He is someone you don't usually see, but he works here at Channel 7 because he's behind the camera. He's one of our videographers and has been for quite some time. But I wanted to have a conversation with him about a recent trip that he took to Cuba and to hopefully shed some light and some information to all of you there at home. Matthew, thanks for joining us on Spotlight. Thanks for having me. Um, so why did you go to Cuba? I'd always wanted to go, really early in my TV career, I'd worked in Florida and I'd worked with uh, a gentleman who had been on a Cuban exile. He was from Cuba, Havana, and he'd come over on the Mariel boat lift uh -huh. in, in the late 70s. And I'd always wanted to see Cuba because I'd heard so much from him. All right, so tell me about your experience. You traveled over with your aunt. Uh -huh. Yes, I went with my aunt, who's a world traveler, and two cousins. Uh -huh. And she's, she's been everywhere in the United States. You, or, excuse me, the world you can go. Wow. And so that's one of the lu luxuries in our family is if you need to go someplace and you've never been, she'll tell you how to go and, and where to go and everything else. So she booked a trip and she had the same idea I had, which is we didn't want to just fly into Havana and look around. She, so we booked a cruise, uh -huh. which had three stops. And so it was seven days. And the interesting- You departed from Florida? No, we departed from Havana, flew into Havana, spent okay. three days in Havana, and the first night we spent with a Cuban family. So you cruised around Cuba. Exactly, but mm -hmm. we stayed the first night with an actual, you know, a Cuban family in an Airbnb situation where you stay in the upstairs apartment and they're downstairs. Uh -huh. And that's a really popular thing in Havana for tourists. So we stayed there and you got to see sort of how ordinary people live in Havana. How do they live? 
they live probably a little just above the poverty line is what I saw. Uh -huh. You know, they're very entrepreneurial people, and this whole thing of having American tourists, they're really for, so they're very friendly towards you. But the interesting- Because that's revenue coming in for Cuba. Yeah, it's brand new revenue. We're only 90 miles away, so everybody, a lot of people are coming in, and a lot of people have already been to different parts of the Caribbean. A lot of people are worried about, well, I want to come in to this area because I want to, uh, I'm not, I want to see it before it changes. Are they as curious about us as we are them? They are. They're, they're very curious about our culture, and they, they immediately will ask you questions about, well, what is your favorite band? You know, what about this TV show I'm hearing? Because they don't get our, the, our culture like other countries do. Do they think our way of life is a good way of life, or do they view it as uh, we have too much of maybe everything? No, they, they, they want our culture. They want, they, they want more entrepreneurial things. You know, we, we start up a small business. You know, if your friend comes to you and says, well, I'm starting up a small business, it's like, oh, big deal. There, it's a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge thing for them. They're really excited about doing it. The guy we stayed with, you know, he kept asking us, you know, is everything okay? Is this up to your standards for travel? You know, because we were staying in this apartment above him. They wanted you to be happy. They do, and, and they wanted, they also want to know, you know, is there something we should change? And the other interesting part about visiting Havana in particular is they're going through this gigantic restaurant explosion. So you go to a Havana restaurant, it's completely different than, than anything in the United States, like going to an Applebee's. Okay, right. food good? It's great, uh, they use a lot of rice, they don't have any beef because I found out this is a very interesting part of the trip was the beef are actually owned by the state. So there's not a lot of beef because there's not a lot of profit in growing beef. So they eat a lot of pork and they eat a lot of fish. You mentioned that the family you stayed with, in your opinion, was just sort of above the poverty line. Uh, do they view themselves that way? And are they happy or are they miserable with the economic level that they have? No, they seem very happy, and the one thing that they keep pointing out to you is we get free health care, we get free education, we have a free house, mm -hmm. and they get free food. So those are major staples in their life. Exactly, and so they are always reminding you of that when you're, when you're there and you're visiting with them. When we come back, I want to talk about some of the other experiences that you went through. I know uh, you encountered baseball over there. We'll be right back with videographer Matthew Dale. Where else did you go? We went to uh, a town called Cienfuegos, which is uh, on the south side of the island. And we went to another town uh, called uh, uh, Santiago de Cuba. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, Marco Polo, or not Marco Polo, that's where uh, Christopher Columbus first visited. Okay. So there, those were two interesting stops. And then we spent three days in Havana. How were those places different than Havana? Well, Cienfuegos is uh, like a resort town. It would be like comparable to like a saga talk, but just not as nice. Mm -hmm. And then Santiago de Cuba is the second biggest town. And that was very interesting. That's where they consider it the cradle of the revolution. Mm -hmm. And they, they have the fort that Castro attacked that's still in attack, intact and they take you around that. So it's really interesting to see sort of um, the towns and how clean they are. They're extraordinarily clean for, for a town. You know, low size that that size, and the people seem to be they're a little more outside than they were in Havana, and they're a little more jovial. Do you think communism will continue to go in the vein that Castro uh, always promoted it, or do you think now that Castro is no longer there, uh, things are going to change and change drastically, especially now that America is in there and more entrepreneurship? I think they're going to go with the entrepreneurship route. I think you're going to see less and less of the communism hardline rule that Castro brought in. And the reason is technology. They want technology of the people. That was the underlying theme. And I was, by my last day, I was walking along and I, and, and, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw people on, a, six people sitting there on, in, in a telephone booth making calls on pay phones. I haven't seen that in 20 years. Yeah, it's and been a I while saw, since I've seen the telephone booth. And, yeah. and there was a guy sitting there and he, and he just looked at me and he spoke English and he goes, I don't have a smartphone. 
And he was kind of looking at my phone in my hand because I was taking pictures with my iPhone. Yeah. And he, it was just a hilarious moment because they want that. They want the more of the technology. They want better internet And service. most people over there don't have the smartphones that we've become absolutely attached to. Exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, the cars. Uh, everybody, when you talk Cuba, first thing that I think comes to most people's mind are the old cars. Um, is it as interesting to see that? Is it sort of like going to Mackinac on a throwback with the horses? Exactly. It's actually more interesting when you actually get to get to ride in them and get, you can choose which ones you want to ride in. You know, take a tour. We took a tour around Havana in one, and it was really interesting because that was my aunt's thing that she had wanted to do. And so it was kind of interesting for her because she would go up to these cars and say, well, you know, your Uncle Larry, uh, you know, your great Uncle Larry, he drove a Pontiac and he always drove that car, you know, that 55, he had that. So it was kind of an interesting trip down memory lane. But the cars are a huge source of pride with Cuban people because they've been able to keep them on the road for all these years, you know, by making their own parts, by making their own quarter panels. And so that tradition of being able to do that is handed down generation to generation. And Most memorable part of your trip. That would have been the discussion about baseball. I didn't know that that's their national pastime also. Yeah. You know, I'm a huge Tigers fan, just like a lot of people in Detroit. And they pulled up to this uh, arena, uh, one of their stadiums in Cienfuegos. You know, we went by it and then, and, then, and then they stopped for a little brief time and I got to talk to the guy. And they have, just like we have the big tiger outside, uh -huh. they have the big elephant because they're the elephants. Okay. And that's a huge, huge sign of pride. And he, I had an interesting discussion with one of the, the tour guides who spoke great English. And I, he's like, well, our stadium is very modest compared to yours because they, they know what ours look like. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, who built yours? And he said, well, the government, of course. And he said, well, who built yours? And he thought that the rich owners built it. And I had to explain to him what a <laughs> rental car tax was and how the money for these stadiums comes from the taxpayers. And that blew his mind. OK, all right. So, so the government's in there just in a slightly different type of way. Uh, what advice uh, would you finally give to Americans who are thinking about going to Cuba? I, I would suggest trying to, to, to find a tour where they take you out and show you a little bit of their life, you know, the, find a Cuban guide, you know, go on one of these state sponsored tours if you can, because they do take you and try to immerse you into their, their culture. I didn't, like I said, with the baseball, I didn't know, you know, that's a big sore point with them. American baseball is taking a lot of their big stars away a little quicker than anyone wants. They don't so you like get a little, that. Exactly. And then you get to see a little more of their culture and how they live with communism. The, the thing that really surprised me was how frank they were when you asked them about communism and, and what, what was going on in their life. Matthew Dale, thanks for coming in and sharing your very personal experiences uh, through the eye of someone who makes his living as a videographer, even though you weren't on assignment for Channel 7. That's right. Uh, once you get that frame of mind, you're going to always be looking at things the way journalists and photojournalists look at things. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thank you. And we want to thank you at home for joining us. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight and everything we couldn't squeeze into the unair portion here. Click over to WXYZ.com as we continue our conversation. Have a great week.